our guest speaker is Casey with uh, Wisconsin DNR. You want to do a little intro? Go ahead. Go ahead. My mic? Yeah, can, mic? You, yeah. can you guys hear me? Um, yeah, so I went to Wisconsin DNR. I've been in my position for about six years now. Prior to this, I came from Idaho and Missouri and Illinois, um, kind of worked all over. Um, and I cover with, in Wisconsin, St. Croix, Pierce, and Western Dunn counties, um, so the upper part of the Driftless area. Um, and tonight, if we're ready for it, I'm going to be talking about a really cool story, or at least I think it's a really cool story. Um, and if you like Brooks out, you're going to think it's really cool, too. Um, and once we get the slides going here. No, you're fine. While we're waiting, I do have spreadsheets here from all of our 2023 sampling results. I usually bring those. I think I brought them last year. Um, and basically it tells you how many trout were where, the sizes of trout in all the stations that we surveyed across my two and a half counties that I cover. So if you are interested in those, I have paper copies up here. They're two pages each, so make sure you grab two pages. Otherwise, I can send you a virtual copy if you send me an email. So. There's a lot of technology going on. Yeah, I got it right now. There we go. Cool. Okay. All right. So, like I said, I'm going to be talking about this really, um, really cool and innovative project that we've been working on for since I started, basically, um, since 2018. Um, we are working to restore brook trout in Katy Creek, um, specifically Lower Katy Creek. Um, in uh, I'm used to having a clicker in Pierce County, um, Wisconsin. So, oops, can click to the next one. First of all, I want to thank my crew, um, Brian Spangler. He's going to be retiring this year after 37 years in the Wisconsin DNR. Um, we're sad to see him go. And then I've got my two tech, two other technicians, Dustin Scher and Sam Jacobson. They're a huge help. They actually did the majority of this project in 2023 all on their own. So I want to thank them um, for all of their, their help and support for all of this. Next slide. Um, so, as you guys know, we have two main trout species in Wisconsin and Minnesota, the brook and the brown trout. Um, we have limited rainbow stocking in the driftless area. Rainbows are stocked here and there. Um, but mostly we're dealing with brook trout and brown trout. Brook trout are our only inland native trout species. Um, brown trout are not native. They were actually introduced from Europe. I'm sure a lot of you guys know this. Um, but even though they're introduced, we still manage for them. They still create really great fisheries. Um, so we also stock them. Um, we stock them in many streams throughout the driftless area. So both of these species are very important, um, but only one is native, um, and we still manage for, for both species. You can click that. So just, just very brief background of what we've been encountering in a lot of our driftless area streams is that we are seeing streams that were once completely brook trout streams um, or brook trout dominant streams switch to brown trout dominant streams or totally brown trout. So basically brown trout are excluding brook trout in many streams across the driftless area. Um, click the next one. So these are just a few streams um, that we have documented this happening. Um, this is just in my management area. Um, and two other biologists, the biologist out of Black River and the biologist out of Little Cross. Um, I just asked them for a list of streams where they have seen this happen. And so this includes our three management areas and all of these streams we've seen brook trout fisheries decline and brown trout um, fisheries increase in all of these streams. Next slide. Um, so why? Why is this happening? Um, a lot of it is very stream- A hard time with the camera. Gotcha. One second. 
No, no problem. Yeah, no worries. I know how technology goes most of the time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. We want to smash it. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Awesome. Is it up here? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Now maybe this will this work now? Yeah. Sweet. Okay. Back on track. Thank you. Um. Yeah. So why are we seeing brook trout decline in all of these streams? And it's not just these streams that I named. I mean, it's all across Wisconsin. So first thing you think of is temperature increases, um, potentially due to climate change. Um, Wisconsin has done a, a lot of modeling and we, we found that we're predicted to lose about 70% of our brook trout streams in, by mid-century. Um, so we're really predicted to have a lot of warming, maybe more drought, and that's definitely gonna impact brook trout. We're predicted to lose. So maybe we're seeing the beginning of that happening. Um, in some streams, like I said, I think it's very stream specific. Um, it differs a lot why we're seeing these changes. Um, it could also be habitat changes. With our habitat projects that we've done, um, we have seen brown trout become the dominant species, brook trout kind of um, decline after we do our habitat project um, because we're making habitat that really favors adult brown trout. We are working to change that. I've been doing some experimental habitat techniques. So we're trying to focus more on brook trout in our habitat projects. Um, another reason for brook trout declines is stocking changes. Um, and I'm gonna get into this because that's the whole crux of what I'm gonna talk about, um, specifically when within the O'Galley and its tributaries. Did anybody fish, has anybody ever fished the O'Galley or KD? Lots, okay, I see several people. So you're from, some people are some familiar. Um, and also disturbance. I really think this is a huge one. Brook trout are pretty sensitive species. Um, brown trout, a little less sensitive. They can tolerate a wider range of environmental conditions. Um, so if some kind of disturbance occurs, whether it be drought, whether it be changes in habitat, um, flood events, that kind of thing, I think brown trout have a lot better adaptation strategies to deal with those big events than brook trout do. So I think that happens in a watershed or a stream, you know, brook trout are, we have seen brook trout decline due to those things. There we go, yep, we're good. Um, so one thing I just wanna talk about in particular is Pine Creek, another stream in my management area. It's in far Southeast Pierce County, a little stream. Um, we've did a ton of habitat work on this in the past, and this is all from Kent Johnson's um, study that he did um, evaluating the effects of the habitat work on the fishery, um, as well as water quality. He did a ton of monitoring. Um, so basically we did all of this habitat work and now the stream is basically a brown trout stream. Um, <coughs> trout are left, um, but we saw very measurable improvements in stream temperature. So our habitat work decreased the temperature of the stream. And this is already a very, very cold stream. Um, this is still the coldest stream within my management area. I mean, we'll go there in late July and it's gonna be like 56 degrees. Um, it's very, very cold, ton of springs, ton of groundwater. But even with that um, cold water and the improvement in water temperature, we still lost brook trout there. Um, so even, you know, this cold water regime didn't provide a competitive advantage to brook trout. So temperature isn't always the answer. Um, just wanted to point that out in this little case study 
um, and this is what we've seen in Pine Creek. So these are catch rates um, through the years, so starting in 2000 all the way to current. These are catch rates of brook trout and brown trout. So brook trout's green, brown trout is the rest or brown color. So here is when habitat work began. They did do some brown trout removal here, but it was very limited and they only did it for two years. So it didn't work. Um, and basically after that, brown trout just increased exponentially. And at the same time, brook trout just declined and they're almost non-existent at this site anymore, um, which is really unfortunate. So that's Pine Creek right now, really high density brown trout fishery. So Katie Creek, you know, some of you said you fished it and you're familiar with it, but if you're not, um, it's located in um, far northeast um, Pierce County. Um, kind of um, a little chunk of it is in Dawn and a little chunk is in St. Croix. But this is the watershed that it's in. Um, the green line here is Katy. And then this is the O'Galley River, this blue. These are just the classifications, the colors mean that. Don't worry about that. Um, but this is where it's located. So right here is the confluence with the O'Galley right around the little town of Elmwood. And then you can see here where it's located in the within the counties. There we go. Oh, now it's probably gonna go too much. So why, so we've, we're putting a lot of effort and we have a lot of interest in maintaining the brook trout population in Katy. So why, why do we care this much about Katy Creek? Um, it's a class one tributary to the O'Galley. Class one just meaning it's the best of the best. It has um, plenty of natural production. We don't need to stock it because it's got a ton of natural production, um, fairly moderate to high density fishery. Um, and basically enough trout to main, to occupy the available habitat. So the class one streams are the best of the best. Um, it's an exceptional resource water, has amazing water quality, um, and it's one of the few brook trout fisheries left in Pierce County that's actually like, that's of a fishable size, I should say. We've got some tributaries that are pretty small here and there that hold brook trout, but for a fishable size stream, it's one of the last good brook trout fisheries we have left in the county. Um, these fish have also been genetically tested um, and we've determined that they are the wild heritage strain of brook trout, just meaning they haven't been influenced by hatchery genetics in the past, um, which is really important. We don't have that everywhere. Um, and historically it's had very high densities of brook trout and it still does up in the headwaters area. Um, we've put a lot of investment into habitat work in the stream to benefit brook trout almost five miles completed in the early 2000s. Um, and because of its good genetics, we started taking um, brood stock. We started collecting eggs from brook trout in Katy Creek to use those to stock in various streams throughout the state because they have such good genetics. Um, and, 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 and it's a brook trout reserve stream, meaning that you know, I mentioned earlier, um, we're gonna lose 70% of our brook trout streams by mid-century. Katy Creek is one of those streams that were predicted or that is predicted to be able to hold brook trout into the future because it has really good thermals, spring influence, groundwater connection. Um, so it has the potential to maintain its brook trout population. Um, so all of these reasons are why um, we're trying to keep brook trout around in this stream. Come on. There we go. So just a little bit about the past management and how we got to where we were or how we are. Um, so prior to 2005, mm -hmm. the O'Galley River was stocked every year with brown trout. Mm -hmm. Those brown trout were oh. domestic strain. Um, <laughs> just meaning that the, this strain of brown trout has been raised in the hatchery like decades after decades. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's lost some, some of its wild characteristics maybe, but it's very, um, domesticated I guess you would say um, so we we were stocking this strain in the O'Galley every year prior to 2005 2005 um, that stocking strain was changed to the timber coolie strain of brown trout um, which is a wild strain of brown trout those fish are collected down near the little cross area and just like we're using brook trout out of Katy um, we're using the timber coolies 
to stock around the state in different brown trout streams. So a wild strain of brown trout. This is key. Are you watching the program? Yes, I am. So after this stocking strain changed in the Ogallee, two years later in 2007. Hey, I'm sorry to cut it for just a second, Casey. Uh, Jill Chauvin, if you're listening, can you please um, mute yourself? There, they've just made history, basically. And they increased to over 1,000 fish per mile by 2018. It took them a while to get going, um, but once they got going by 2018, um, they were basically on the verge of surpassing brook trout numbers in several sites. Um, and there were higher densities of brown trout further downstream from this site. Oh, no, now it's working good. Okay. Um, so Katy Creek, um, this is the same, same that you saw for Pine Creek. So this is fish per mile. And then we've got from 1984 all the way to 2021. I didn't include the last couple years because that's for later. Um, so if you look, you know, prior, you know, in the 80s, brook trout were around, very low densities started increasing and after we did this habitat restoration work in the early 2000s brook trout numbers skyrocketed very high densities of brook trout um and then this year is when that that strain of brown trout stock meal galley changed um and then two years later boom we see brown trout show up and then from there they've kind of bounced around a little bit kind of hung in low densities and then we really really started to um, see increases in them um, around the time that I started in this position. Um, so knowing that and knowing what happened in Pine Creek, we're like, hold up, we need to do something about this. Um, and then just to give you an idea, because I, I mentioned earlier, brook trout are still the dominant species and they're basically the only species way up in the headwaters area. So this is still catch rates of brook and brown trout. And then on the bottom, instead of the year, these are different sites. So you can think of this as kind of the headwaters or upper Katy all the way down to lower Katy near the confluence of the O'Galley. So the stream flowing downstream in the headwaters in this upper um, region up here, we've still got very strong brook trout numbers. And then as you move downstream, the brown trout are basically taking over. Um, so that's kind of the great, and this was in 2019, the status of, of Katy Creek fishery. So um, what are we going to do about it? <laughs> um, so this is where I came in in 2018. I see this happening. Me and my team kind of developed this plan. Um, the first thing that we did was stop brown trout stocking in the O'Galley River. This was going to relieve any pressure that was pushing more and more browns into Katy Creek. Um, so now we are only stocking brook trout in the O'Galley. Brown trout are still there. They are naturally reproducing in the O'Galley. This timber coolie strain of, of brown trout seems to be really good at being able to establish natural reproduction and they did it in the O'Galley. So that was our first thing, stop stocking. Um, then the next thing I did was I changed the fishing regulations in Katy Creek um, to allow more anglers to keep brook trout or brown trout to keep brown trout and protect brook trout a little bit more. So this year, um, beginning on the opener, um, people will be, be able to keep five brown trout, no minimum length limit, and brook trout are catch and release only. Um, so we're really trying to focus people um, to harvest brown trout in Katy and Pine Creek as well. Um, so that was the next step. And then we were kind of limited in what we could do without impacting other fisheries downstream. Um, we decided to go with mechanical brown trout removal. This means we used our electrofishing gear to shock them and take them out of the stream. Um, I, know, I don't know if you guys have heard of rotenone, but it's um, basically a chemical that kills fish. We didn't want to do that because we have this, you know, the O'Galley is connected um, and we didn't want to impact, you know, the entire watershed. So we decided to go this route. Um, I'll get into how we did that and what we did with the fish in a second. Um, also develop some kind of fish barrier that's temporary so that we can control browns that are moving into Katy from the O'Galley because we have a naturally producing population of brown trout in the O'Galley now. So they're always gonna be there. Um, 
And then we also did a wild fish transfer of brook trout from that very high density area upstream in Katy to these low density areas where basically there weren't many brook trout left by the time we started doing this. So we wanted to kind of boost that population downstream um, to where they could have a better chance of um, gaining a hold back and getting natural production starts again um, at good levels. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so part one, the removals. Um, we're killing brown trout. Um, so this began in 2018. We started with doing two days of removals, um, and this is just kind of the timeline. So 2019, we kind of increased it to three days, six sampling events. It's, and it's on, in the grand scheme of things, it's not that much effort that we're, that we're putting into this. We're doing this in the fall when the browns are moving up into Katy to spawn. Um, so we're really targeting them, trying to target them before they actually spawn um, so that they're not laying their eggs and those fry can't hatch out and repopulate Katy. Um, we continued in 2020, even though we had COVID restrictions, we had to use our backpack shockers. Um, we did it for three days and five different sampling events. Um, and throughout this time, we donated all the fish to a local nursing home and they actually ate the fish and filleted them. And during that time, we were getting a decent number of adults that were a harvestable size or a filetable size. But after these few years, um, we really knocked the adult population back. Um, so we weren't getting very many fish that would make it worth it to donate to the nursing home anymore. So we switched to donating the trout to a wildlife rehab center. Um, and they've been using all the trout. Um, and 2020 was such a hard year to deal with because even though we had a huge flood event, I don't know if you guys remember in late, um, late summer, the huge flood event, even with that, um, the numbers of young of year that year were just crazy. Um, so we had a lot of fish to deal with in 2020, a lot of, a lot of little guys um, that year. So, and you'll see in the next few graphs um, um, how much that really was. So after that, we're like, holy cow, there's a lot of young of year in here. We need to we need to increase our sampling. We need to or increase our removal. We need to go all the way upstream, um, even further to the extent where brown trout have colonized. So you can see our sampling events increase, um, and we include our summer sampling. We remove young of year during our summer sampling as well. Um, so a lot of removal, um, and I get a lot of questions. Why don't you move these fish somewhere else where they can still live and, you know, instead of stocking a stream, um, you can utilize these fish. Um, our movement, we have a lot of movement restrictions on live fish um, because of disease transfer. Um, VHS in particular, we're finding out that more water bodies than we were aware of have VHS. Um, so we're really, really careful. And to move fish, it requires it's, it's very difficult. We have to hold fish for so many days um, in, in an area before we move and they have to be tested. And then once we get the test results back, then we can move them. But it depends on where we're moving them. So it's, it's very hard to move fish. And Pierce County has brown trout all over the place. So we didn't really have a good spot to move them. Um, so that's why we went this route. Um, and there we go. So these are, this is the results so far. The number of brown trout removed is here on the left side and the years since we started is on the bottom. Um, so you can see the, the gray bars are how many trout were removed each year. I said 2020 was a huge year. So this 2021 was crazy and it was all young of year and yearling fish. Um, so a lot of fish less than six inches um, com comprised this year. And after that, we've had a really heavy decline in the number of fish that we removed. Um, 2023 was our best year yet. Um, and so this is the miles of stream that we removed on this side. So these little dots are how many miles that we shocked and we removed. So we're averaging about five to five and a half miles now of stream that we're continuously shocking. Um, so it, it has become more manageable now that our fish numbers are so low, but it's it's a long stretch of stream that we're shocking. Um, and I should have included, and I do have a graph here that will show you, but we're seeing huge improvements in our brook trout numbers that I will get to later. Okay, 
Um, <laughs> so this is the same, this is brown trout again, um, just showing you um, the different um, length or age classes of fish. So young of year are the blue. Um, so 2021, that was a huge, huge proportion of fish compared to other years. 2020 and 2021 was just crazy for natural reproduction. The adult fish, so anything over six inches is red um, and the blue is just total. So those combined and then the number of miles is this yellow line. So same thing, but you can see um, how it's all split up. In 2023, like I said, it was our best year yet that we saw the most improvement. Um, but we're still getting decent amounts of young of year. Um, and that's kind of key and that's kind of led us into this other project that I'm gonna foreshadow again. Um, and this is the result. So catch rates of fish um, on the y-axis and this is at a trend site. So we have continuous sampling data throughout the years. Um, brook trout's green, brown trout's brown. Um, and you can, this is the same graph as earlier, but I added the most recent years on the end where you can see what the brook trout have done. Um, so green's brook trout and they've just continuously um, continued to increase basically. Um, so now we're back up to about 1500 fish per mile brook trout and you can see what the Browns did between 2020 and 2020 or 2022 and 23. They've um, declined substantially. Um, so that's really what we wanna see. Um, so our removal efforts are really paying off. But like I said, we still have this connection with the O'Galley River. Um, so brown trout from the O'Galley are still coming into Katy to spawn because we're still getting these young of year. Um, and Katy Creek basically acts as spawning, rearing, and a nursery stream for brown trout in the O'Galley. Um, so we need some kind of a barrier. Um, my counterpart in La Crosse and in Black River Falls, um, each of us are doing these brown trout removals. They're actually able to transfer their fish downstream because they have a barrier to work with. Um, so that's great for them, but we don't have that in Katie. I actually looked at installing one um, and it would just back up water for over the length of a football field, our habitat specialists determined. And that just really wasn't a great, a great idea. And I, I don't think it would have been permitted either. Um, so we need some kind of barrier. It has to be temporary, um, but we need to know when to specifically install it. Um, so this was our weir. I got a weir um, from our Pestrigo crew over on the east side of the state. Um, these types of weirs are usually used for collecting trout um, in or whatever time they're spawning, whether it be the fall or the spring, to collect them for egg collection in some of the larger rivers. Um, this is a mini version. We just took pieces off of it because Katie's so small. Um, and then I'll show you, it's just a, not a good picture to see what is actually going on. But this was, this is from Oregon. Um, I just pulled this off the internet, but it's the same concept. It's a weir. So any fish um, that are coming upstream basically get funneled into this trap. Um, and then from there, they can either pass them upstream or they can take them and usually they collect eggs or whatever they need to do um, from, from the fish. So large scale, this is what we have in Katy Creek, um, which there are pros and cons to. Um, this was our first year trying it out was last year. It did prevent fish movement upstream into Katy. It was pretty easy to install. We have a really good place to put it. A landowner lets us drive straight down to the creek, um, which is awesome, easy access. Um, and we can let brook trout pass above the barrier to go and do their thing. Um, the cons, we didn't trap any fish last year. So it still prevented fish from moving upstream, but there was something wrong with our trap. Um, we just, fish just weren't going into it. So this was like hand built. So we're modifying that. Um, and another con, it needs to be checked at least two times a day. Fall, we've got leaf off. Um, there's a ton of aquatic vegetation coming downstream, so it'll get plugged up pretty quick. So we would need to check it and clean it twice a day, which adds up to a lot of travel time and staff time. Um, so we really need to pinpoint when we're installing this so we get the most bang for our buck. Um, so basically in next year, 
um, in the future years. We've got to figure out what's wrong with our trap. Something's wrong with our trap. But at least we were preventing movement upstream from brown trout. Um, and we've got to understand the exact timing that brown trout are coming up. So to do that, we developed this trout movement study. We collaborated with our research staff that are um, down in Madison. And we came up with this study to evaluate seasonal trout movement. And I should start clicking this like way ahead of time. <laughs> um, there, maybe I just need to get it closer. Okay, oh, I think I went too far. Nope, I didn't. Okay, so the way we're gonna evaluate trout movement is we are using pit tags. So that is a pit tag. It's the same thing that um, dogs and cats are tagged with when you microchip them. Um, so it has an individual number and it stands for or passive integrated um, transponder tag. So it will track the movement of individual fish. And we had two arrays set up in Katy Creek and the arrays are just a place where if a fish passes through it that has that tag in it, it will be detected. Um, so we, another part to the study was that our researcher wanted to evaluate brook and brown trout passage through beaver dams. Um, because there are studies that have shown that brook trout can more easily pass through a beaver dam than brown trout can. Um, so he wanted to evaluate that in driftless area streams in Wisconsin. So he was looking at that and I was able to evaluate brown trout movement, um, seasonal movement. So it was kind of a two part study. Um, this is one of the arrays in Katy Creek. Um, it's pretty simple looking. Um, it's just got two wires, we use T posts to stretch the wires across the stream. One wire is on the bed of the stream, the other one is above um, the top of the water. So anytime a trout passes through there, these wires um, are hooked up to a computer and it picks up the individual tag number of the fish. Um, and then we know exactly what time and the day that that fish was there. Um, and by having two of them, we can get directional movement so we can see, you know, oh, it was, you know, it was picked up on the downstream array and then it actually passed the upstream array, so we know it was going upstream. Um, so it's really cool, um, a really cool study um, that we got to work on with this. Um, there we go. So to do this, we tagged brown trout and brook trout. Brown trout to, uh, we, more, more brown trout were tagged than brook trout, but we tagged them throughout, um, the O'Galley, so the confluence with Katie is like right about here. So we focused on this area of the O'Galley, basically guessing that a lot of these fish in this part of the O'Galley are gonna use Katie to spawn. And then we also tag trout all the way um, in Katie, all the way up to here. The beaver dams and where the arrays are located are right up in here. Um, so the arrays and then all of our tag trout are located throughout this stretch. We did the, we did the tagging throughout the summer. Oh God, okay. <laughs> okay, so we tagged over a thousand trout, which is quite a bit. Um, it's a little more time consuming than our normal sampling, but we were able to tag over a thousand fish. Um, 272 of those were brookies, 200, or 743 were brown trout. Um, we inserted the tags into the body cavity of the fish. Um, just We didn't want to deal with anglers potentially harvesting these fish and crunching into the tag um, because normally we tag them in the dorsal, below the dorsal fin, so it would be in the fillet. Um, so to avoid that, we tagged them in the body cavity um, and we marked our tagged brown trout by clipping their adipose fin. So then um, in the future, if we caught this fish and it had a clip, but we didn't detect the tag, that means it had lost its tag. So we can kind of evaluate tag loss rate too. Um, and brook trout were tagged by um, this little yellow, it's like an elastomer tag, it's in their pectoral fin. So it's really hard to notice, um, but if you look at their pectoral fin, um, there'll be a little um, yellow, it looks like plastic, like inside of their fin, um, which is a really innovative way to tag fish. Um, but that's the way they were tagged externally so we could tell if they should or shouldn't have a pit tag inside them. And then um, our readers, um, pit tag readers, every time we catch a trout um, in Katy Creek, um, we would scan the fish with our reader and that'll bring up its individual um, tag number. So our arrays are picking up tagged fish and then every time we sample, we're able to pick up tagged fish. And I actually have a couple anglers 
they're out there with tag or with uh, um, the detectors. So every time they catch a trout, they can scan it and then they can write that down. We can see, oh, this, this trout was here at this day and now it's here on this day. So we can kind of track movement that way too. Um, so we're getting a lot of data out of these studies, um, able to evaluate seasonal movement of brown trout and brook trout, um, evaluate tributary use of, you know, Katy Creek from fish coming from the O'Galley River, um, and trout passage through beaver dams, which is going to be pretty interesting as well. Um, and from this, we can also evaluate growth of trout through our recapture events. So we know how long the fish was when we initially tagged it. And then after, year after year, if we catch these fish, we're able to see how fast they're growing because we'll be able to measure them um, each time we capture that individual fish. Um, and also evaluate um, habitat use. So um, depending on what time of year we're, we're sampling, whether it passes the array or not, we know, you know where this fish is moving um, throughout the season. Um, so our future plans, um, this was a nice brookie we caught in 2022. It was um, a 14 and a half inch brook trout from Katie, um, which was really cool to see. I just wanted to point that out um, because we are seeing higher survival and fish are getting to larger sizes now within Katie, um, brook trout specifically because likely because of this brown trout removal because we're, we're freeing up resources um, and habitat um, and brook trout are able to survive and grow um, a at better rates than when the brown trout were there. Um, so in the future, we do plan to continue our brown trout removals because we are seeing really good success with it. Um, and we're doing our, we have two trend sites in Katy and a couple in the O'Galley. So we're continuously monitoring those year after year. So we're gonna continue our monitoring so we can really fully see the effects of all of these management actions that we're taking. Um, continue stocking brook trout in the O'Galley River. Um, and then unfortunately, I don't have any um, data to share with you today on the trout movement stuff. Um, I just haven't had time to analyze that yet, but that's coming. So we'll get all of that analyzed and then we'll be able to see exactly when we should install our weir this coming fall um, to prevent brown from moving into Katy and help us out with our removal. So we don't have to remove as many of them. And I just wanted to mention last year, um, we surveyed Isabel Pine and Plum Creek with the entire watershed. Um, so I do have reports for those available if you guys are interested in those. Um, in 2024, um, we plan to sample Wilson, Annis, and Gilbert Creek, which are in Western Dunn County. Um, so those will be sampled um, basically in its entirety and all of these reports are available. And like I said, if you're interested in our sampling results from last year, please um, come and pick those up. Um, at the end. And with that, I can take any questions you guys have. Okay, we'll do the online questions first, Kim. Okay. <laughs> so, Bob, we'll do the online questions first. Okay, so uh, this is Bob. Can you guys hear oh, me okay? Yeah. Hey, Bob, we're ready for a question. Okay, online. so I'm waiting for some questions from our very shy online audience. But meanwhile, I do have one question for you. And that is, it seems like you've really taken out the large browns from the stream. Do you have any idea whether small browns compete with brook trout as much as large browns? Can you tell me to repeat that question again? Yeah, you want to re repeat that? Sorry, Bob, the first part was cut off. I'm sorry, I was saying that uh, you showed some data that you've removed almost all of the large browns from Katie and you still have a lot of the young of year, smaller fish. And I'm just wondering if um, those small browns, if you happen to know if they do as much competition with the brook trout as the larger browns. Yeah, that's a good question. Um... I would say for the smaller browns, it's pro it's probably more of a competition thing than a predation thing. I think the larger fish, the larger brown trout, there's probably more a lot more pressure on predation um, from those fish. So they're eating a lot of brook trout. Um, and even when we're shocking um, during our normal sampling, you know, we continuously have browns spitting up young of your brook trout. Um, so it's definitely a thing. We don't have, we haven't um, actually did a study to quantify how much of that that's happening, but 
with those smaller brown trout, you know, six to 11 inches that are, that were pretty abundant during those few years, that's just like the perfect size to compete with adult brook trout, just because they're all the same size and eating the same thing. Um, so I think, I think controlling, you know, the bigger adults and the smaller adults is, you know, you're controlling two different things, but it's um, making a huge difference um, when you're taking both of them out. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from Paul Odenbach, and he's wondering if there are any plans for more work on Pine Creek. For more, like, um, are you talking like habitat work? Um, we don't have plans to continue habitat work just because we have basically um, did improvement work for the extent of our fishery area, our DNR land. Um, so no future plans for habitat work. As far as trying to restore the brook trout population in there, it would be a very big undertaking. Um, and at the point when we started this in Katy, Pine Creek was already like way further down the line as far as brown trout numbers and very few brook trout left. So that's why we didn't take Pine Creek on. And densities are so high in Pine Creek. 2021, densities of brown trout in Pine Creek were 10,000 fish per mile, um, which was insane. Like that's higher than I've ever seen it. And I've, I managed the Kinney and the Kinney is very high. Um, so yeah, it was just too far gone at that point. But I will say, um, there's an area of Pine Creek um, that used to flow underground. It's up by the American Legion. It's pretty high up. Um, it used to flow underground. Now with our really high groundwater levels, for the past couple years, it's been flowing above ground. And brown trout have been able to get up past that underground area and kind of we're, we're monitoring it. We're sampling it every year and taking out the browns that we do encounter. But they are up in that upstream part of Pine that they've never been in. Um, which the genetics of those brook trout up there are very unique. So we're gonna to try to do what we can do to preserve that. Um, but that's that's kind of our plans for Pine Creek. Lots okay. Go fish for browns. Yeah, lot, so, 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 so go ahead and fish for all the browns you want in, in, in Pine Creek, I guess, and, yes. and release the brookies. Yes. <laughs> okay, here's a question from David Brockway. Uh, he says, I'm surprised that you moved the brook trout from upper to lower, lower Katy. I always assumed they would have moved up and down on their own. Yeah, and they probably, they probably do at some point in their life because, well, brook trout do spawn throughout Katy Creek. Um, you know, we can, we can see that um, by the presence of the young of year next, the following year. So they use almost entire Katy Creek to spawn in. Um, so in the upper part of Katy Creek, um, I won't mention any road names, but um, in the upper part of Katy Creek, the densities are very, very high up there. A lot of spawning occurs up there. Um, so densities up there are about 6,000 per mile on average. Um, the size structure is pretty low just because it's kind of a nursery area. So we that's why we chose to take those fish and um, it was actually probably gonna help both areas by reducing some densities up here and taking them downstream and just kind of boosting the population. And they they probably did move back, but I don't think they um, they moved back like that. I think they probably utilized that, all of that open habitat that was in these downstream reaches um, because there weren't many fish left down there at that point. So a lot of habitat to occupy down there, but yes, maybe those fish did go up and now they're using that upper, upper stretch to spawn in now once they're adults. Okay, we have a, a yeah, we have a question from Red Pie that says, I've seen a large increase in Gilbert Creek since the habitat work. Is there any plans on working with that stream in the same way? I'm not sure which stream. Yeah, Gilbert, um, yes, we've seen that that happen. And that was on, on my little list of streams that we've seen it flip from Brooks to Browns. Um, that's another one that I think it would be possible to to basically maybe restore the brook trout there as well. It, it's such a popular, Gilbert is such a popular fishery though um, with the browns present and there's really nice brown trout in there. Um, so that one's gonna, 
gonna kind of be a different story, but it could be a really good potential for something like this to happen there as well. Um, if we do see, you know, brook trout could continue to decline there. Um, yeah, it's another brook trout reserve stream. Um, and the, the way that Browns got in there is that they were actually stocked in lower Gilbert. Um, so, and they just took off from there. So potential, there is a stream. Um, it's another trip to the O'Galley River in Spring Valley, Mines Creek, it's really tiny. It actually has a barrier on it. Um, and it was this beautiful little brook trout stream and Browns somehow, I think I have an idea of how they got up past the barrier. Um, but they're there, but it would be very easy to restore the brook trout population there just because of the size of the stream, so. Bob, do you have any more questions? Yeah, we've got one more question from Mark Nelson. It says, uh, in one of the earlier line charts, it looked like brook trout, brook trout responded favorably to habitat work for a few years, but then brown trout caught up and took over. Did habitat projects result in a short-term gain, but long-term loss for brook trout? And are there habitat projects to avoid when you want to support or favor brook trout? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's exactly what happened in that graph that I showed. Brook trout initially skyrocketed. Um, and that at that point, the brown trout, I, I guess you would say introduction into Katy was very early in the early stages. So they weren't really there in high enough numbers to to do that much damage um, but once they you know found katie creek and all of that great habitat that was just put in there um it was perfect for them and it just created the perfect storm for them to increase and explode in numbers so that's exactly what happened um and we've seen that happen in other streams too and um we are trying to work and change our habitat techniques to favor brook trout um, in certain streams where we're trying to manage brook trout. Um, I, every time I give, tell this story, I wanna make sure people know like we are still managing for brown trout. Um, I have a lot of exceptional brown trout fisheries that I manage and it's definitely an important part of what I do is to have these great brown trout fisheries. So I wanna make sure I say that. Um, but we are in very in specific streams, we're trying to focus on brook trout and we're trying to change things with our habitat projects to favor them. It's, it's difficult because even though there are differences between the species, they're pretty similar in what they favor. Um, so we're just trying to pick out like little things that we can do. And so far in some of our projects, um, we've got two in particular, brook trout, ha we've maintained brook trout. So they haven't declined, which is a step in the right direction, I think. So, yeah, there's more to come with those. Okay, it looks like we don't have any more questions from the, the chat. So we'll open up questions here. And how we'll do that is I'll pass the mic to whoever's going to be speaking. That way the Zoom people, the Zoom audience can hear the question. Who wants to go first? So I guess my question is the primary concern would seem to be in reduction of or removal of brook trout is to ease the predation of, of excuse me, brown trout, ease the predation on brook trout. Is that correct? Um, predation and competition, both those. Yeah, so brown trout and even brook trout, brook trout will eat themselves too. Um, but, you know, brown trout grow even faster and reach much larger sizes than brookies. So there's a lot of predation that goes on, but they're also, like I said, they're, they're pretty similar in what they favor as far as habitat um, and food sources. So there's a lot of competition that goes on too. Um, that with these removals, we can help cut that back. Uh, Quick question on the habitat restoration. When it comes to restoring habitat for brook trout versus brown trout, what are some of the differences there? Yeah, it, great question. Um, I've did a lot of digging into this. Um, so we've been trying to use a lot more of like complex woody structures, complex woody habitat, trying to like mimic kind of like log jams or like a fallen tree. Um, but um, 
with the we've been using a lot of root wads which create like little like kind of micro habitat you know bush otter smaller bodied and they can kind of take advantage of like some smaller micro habitats um so using more complex woody habitat um and also not narrowing the stream as much as we have in the past um our past projects have been great um at creating fish habitat like i've got so many examples that can show you that after our habitat projects, fish numbers tripled, quadrupled. Um, they're great, they're successful, but it really favors adult brown trout. When we narrow them up, um, it creates a really deep run channel. There's not a lot of like smaller fish habitat um, or even young of year habitat. It really favors adult fish. Um, so we've been trying to not narrow it as much. So we're leaving more room, um, more room in the stream for, you know, finer substrates like smaller rock smaller gravel and even sand to accumulate so we've got more diversity of habitat we're using a lot of um, island complexes so we'll actually like put islands in the stream and make these little side channels that brook trout have really um, during our shocking we can see they're really keying in on those these smaller channels they don't have to compete if there are brown trout there they don't have to compete with all these brown trout in one you know straight channel they've got other areas that they can go to and hang out in so we've been doing um the island complexes a lot but the narrowing is huge um not narrowing as much just giving more room for that channel to create like more diversity of habitat um, is what we've kind of been working on so far uh, my question not to get off topic but um with the restoration that you've done on katie creek I was curious to know on the Willow River, um, if brook trout can be stocked in the Willow River or not. So that's my question to you. Yeah, good question. Um, the Willow, so we do, we stock brown trout and rainbow trout in the Willow River um, downstream of the state park um, and upstream of the state park too, actually, up to New Richmond. Um, and even upstream in New Richmond in the Jewett area, um, the willow struggles with um, temperature. Um, that's um, a real problem in the willow. So it's a lot warmer than most of the other streams. You know, it's, it's, it's in northern um, St. Croix County, so the thermals just aren't as good. It's got several dams on it. Um, so brook trout really wouldn't be suited for the willow. Um, the south branch or the south fork of the willow um that is basically almost exclusively brook trout um so that's kind of like a holdout for brookies and they do use the main stem of the willow there um we do get them in our surveys out in the main stem too um but i wouldn't i wouldn't say that we would probably stock brookies just because it struggles with with temperature yeah that's curious to know that yeah yeah i will say though we stock um the race branch, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the race branch, I send a lot of people to the race branch. Um, we stock it with brood stock rainbows, um, so the big guys out of the hatchery um, in the fall and they overwinter pretty well. Um, so the race branch, you can find some really nice rainbows in downstream of the state park. Yeah. Uh, do you know if uh, Duncan Creek, if their numbers of brook trout are ma being maintained? Yeah, that's a good question. It's a, out of my management area, but from what I've heard from that biologist, that brook trout numbers are stable, I believe. Um, they're actually looking at doing a habitat project um, on lower Duncan, I believe, in the near future. So I think they're stable, but um, I can always get you that biologist contact info if you're curious. Okay, so uh, down by me in Westby, we're looking at taking out 25 dams in the Coon and West Fork watersheds, and yeah. two we're concerned with are obviously Maple Dale uh, and Seas Branch. Um, uh, I'm actually over in Stillwater this week for the Stream Restoration Symposium, and uh, there's been a lot of talk about uh, like artificial beaver dams or like beaver dam analogs, mm -hmm. um, and that got me thinking like. I guess what other options are there for barriers that you've explored and what's worked and what hasn't even I'm sure you've been talking to Kirk about some of these things yeah yeah for sure um yeah Kirk's doing his removal in Mapledale putting them downstream of the barrier that's there um so 
some other berries. So the beaver dams, it's, it's, it's interesting. So in Katy, with, with these beaver dams that we had our arrays around, um, we were trying to see, and Katy is so flashy that a lot of the beaver dams just get taken out, you know, every couple years. Um, so they're not a permanent structure. But from what we've seen in our arrays, like by taking a quick glance at it, there's a lot more downstream detections than there is upstream detections. So not many fish were detected upstream of those dams. So it looks like they were at least creating a partial barrier. Um, I'll be really curious to see Brooks and Browns, how that, how that plays out. But um, Pine Creek, um, where I said there was a portion that flowed underground that um, now is flowing above ground, um, at one, they actually got washed out recently, but there was a series of like four or five beaver dams in that area, and we left them hoping that they would prevent brown trout from moving up, and they did until they got washed out. Um, so that's a problem with these um, really high gradient streams that we work on with the beaver dams. Um, they do seem to be a partial barrier for brown trout, um, and we'll know more with our study. Um, but we looked at installing like an actual like low head dam basically in Katy. Um, but like I said, it was just gonna back water up for like over the length of a football field. So we didn't feel like that was feasible. Um, so that's kind of why we're at or where we're at with our weir is that we don't have to create a permanent structure, but we can still kind of limit things. Um, but um, I've had I've heard a lot about the beaver analog structures, but I don't know a lot about them yet. Um, we haven't we haven't seen them used a lot in Wisconsin yet, so I'll be curious to see how those work because it seems like they're becoming more popular um, for habitat. But yeah, good question. Questions over there. Okay. Is there a what's the casualty rate for when you electroshock? Um, normally very close to zero. Um, yeah, it just stuns them. We get them out of the water, you know, as fast as we can. So we're just moving along constantly. And, you know, as soon as we see a fish kind of stun, you know, it's out of the water. So it might only get shocked for a couple seconds. So, um, and the amount of electricity we're using, we're able to like really highly regulate it. Um, so we, we rarely see, um, mortalities with that. Um, unless we're trying to, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a pretty safe method, um, to use on fish. Um, yeah, good question. And before I stop, I forgot to say, um, Randy Arnold with Kayak Fish to You is the hardest working person I know. Um, and he puts on all of these amazing work days. Um, he's been working on the Kinney and his crew has been working on the Kinney. Scott's been there all winter doing a great job. Um, they're working on a pretty big chunk of DNR land on the Kinney um, this year and going to continue that for a few more weeks. So um, if anybody wants to come help out with that, it's a, it's a really, he puts on really great work days and you get hot dogs and cookies at the end too. So just wanted to say that um, doing a really good job on buckthorn removal and box elder removal and getting some native species restored back in there. So just want to put a plug in for his work days. Yeah. With the way the kinney is currently right now, are the fish, that the trout that are in there able to survive through this difficult time? Because the dam, I fished it when it was just a gem and the kinney was, it was a gem to me for so long. And to see it get destroyed was just, I teared up and I was curious to know what you thought of that. So are you referring specifically to the dam? Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty drastic change that we've seen in habitat in the fishery downstream of the dam. They, the fishery is still doing pretty well. Um, on this sheet, if you pick it up, um, we surveyed down by Glen Park down there every year, so we're able to monitor. And yeah, the habitat is a lot worse than what it was. There's a lot of sedimentation. It's filled in a lot, um, pretty shallow in most areas. Um, but I think 
our numbers this past year were still at like 2200 a mile which is still really really good you know that's still like 90th percentile when you're comparing it to other driftless area class one streams so pretty good still but it used to be four to five thousand fish per mile um but there's always a trade-off with that when you have those really high densities yes you still get big fish um but there's more competition with each other when you have really high densities so what we've seen with the reduction in densities is there's a lot more bigger heavier fish out there um which is kind of you know it's interesting there's always like that density de dependence you know um the population kind of depends on the density that's there um so yeah a, a big reduction in densities but the fish that are there are still doing pretty good. Um, there is still some natural reproduction that goes on. There's still some habitat that they're able to spawn in, um, you know, plenty of that to keep them going for sure. But yeah, a big change for sure. Um, so it'll be great when, when that restoration work can get done. Yeah. <laughs> just, what happened to the king? I'm not familiar with that, no. Um, Twenty twenty. Okay, thank you for yeah. Because I don't know all this. Oh, you're good. Yeah, um, you got it. <laughs> I fished the Kinney, I would say, before twenty twenty for about I'd say a good seven seven to eight years. And um the river was such a gem and to see uh the damage in twenty twenty, uh when we had we had a sudden rain that just literally flooded the whole entire river and i mean it created so much damage and all the settlement uh came down from the upper kinney and literally destroyed some of the brit the bridge that was there and it flowed all the way and flooded the whole entire or dam section completely um and when it when it receded, I thought it would might go back to normal, but all the sediment and all that got pushed around. And I mean, I've never seen uh, a massive flood on the Kinney in my life until I until that one day. Um, seeing that was heartbreaking, and I hope I never see that again. Yeah, that flood was crazy. What happens to the fish in that? Do they get pushed down? They they held in there. I mean, they might have got displaced a little bit, but, um, you know, any kind of habitat, that flood, that was in 2020 um, in summer, July, July, yeah. Um, so young of year at that point, you know, they were probably three to four inches long. Um, and even with that flood, I mean, Trout are sensitive, yes, but I think they're more resilient than I and probably a lot of people give them credit for. And they, they did hang in there. Um, you know, they'll just pick out any kind of habitat that they can get to, you know, that's a slow break, and um, they know how to survive. Um, but, you know, the habitat impacts were huge, really, really some bad. A lot of bad erosion and sedimentation happened after, after that flood that degraded habitat a lot. We have any more questions? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that um, movement study or the seasonal movement. Um, yeah. And I was wondering if that has been published. Are you going to publish it, or anywhere can somebody take a look at it? Yeah, I, I hope to publish it. Yes. Um, we just compiled all the data this winter, um, and I haven't had a chance to look at it yet. Just with other reports that I've had to do. Um, so in the next couple months, I plan to start looking to that and analyzing that data and hopefully get, um, get that published. Um, if you're curious about that, I would probably give me a couple months and then I should have, you know, something ready that, um, you guys can read in the reports. Um, so yeah, it's going to be really interesting. And the beaver, the beaver passage thing, that'll be an additional study. Um, and I'm sure that'll get published in some form too. Yeah, good question. I just want to say thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to share all this with you guys. You guys are a great crowd. You always have great questions. So, yeah, thanks for having me. Hey, yeah. Casey. Oh my. And on behalf of PCTU, we oh want my. to present.
a gift for you. Ah, thank you for coming thank out. You. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, you so much. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you guys did not did not have to do this. <laughs> oh, awesome. Thank you. Perfect. So thank you. Thank you. Oh, right, thank you. this. Yeah, yeah. Love it. I love it. I will use this. Yes, I will use both these a lot. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. Thank you yeah. for coming out, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Very cool. <laughs> no, I didn't. That was somebody that wasn't somebody else. Oh, you did? Oh, you did say help.